welcome. My name is Paul Holden. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the President and CEO of the Burnaby Board of Trade and welcome today um, to, to uh, our, our, our uh, online event. Um, before we start, uh, I'd like to take a moment to recognise that we're on the traditional homeland of the Hunkameenam and Skohomish-speaking people, uh, and we extend our appreciation for the opportunity to hold a meeting uh, on this territory. Um, I'd like to, to thank our uh, centre sponsors. This event is part of um, our business resilience programming, which is offered by uh, what we call our Centre for Burnaby Business Resilience. And this was something that was set up um, almost two years ago now, during the early stages of of when COVID first was, was creating some, some impacts. Um, and it was a center that we created through which we channel a lot of our programming and initiatives that support and foster resilience in our business community. Um, initially, we had the word recovery in there as well, but hopefully we're getting um, you know, you know, uh, beyond looking at how we can help businesses in those early stages of recovery and now helping our members and, and, and businesses to build that resilience that, uh, that we all recognize is needed um, going forward. Uh, the Centre for Resilience is sponsored by a number of organisations which help make its work possible. Those uh, organisations include at the platinum level, Simon Fraser University, Douglas College, uh, BCIT School of Business and Media and Electronic Arts. And at the gold level, we have Fortis BC, uh, Hemlock Printers, Parkland Corporation and TD Bank Group. And we thank them for their support, helping us to create a lot of the programming and the work that we do through the, through the Centre. Um, as always, I'd like to thank our annual partners, who are the organisations who stand out as top corporate citizens in Burnaby and support our work throughout the year. We always make a point of recognising those partners um, at each of our events, and uh, uh, the, the, the notes are, the, the logos are just reappearing uh, on screen right now, and you can see uh, a great group there, and I will just recognise them one by one. Um, at the platinum level, we have the Burnaby Now, we have Parkland Corporation, we have uh, Simon Fraser University, Douglas College, and the BCIT School of Business and Media. At the Gold Partnership level, uh, we have Pacific Blue Cross, Electronic Arts, uh, the BD Group, and ABC Recycling. And at the uh, Silver level, we have Scotiabank, Bluemith Technologies, Tra Trans Mountain, Appia Developments, uh, Port of Vancouver, TD Bank, Fortis BC, and Alexander College. So thank you very much to all of those organizations. Um, and we're going to be now uh, uh, asking some uh, uh, our sponsors for the centre to, to make a few uh, welcoming comments. Before I do that, just wanted to recognise we've got some of our friends here from the Richmond uh, Chamber of Commerce. So, so uh, welcome, Shana, and welcome to those of you that are joining us um, from, from Richmond. Uh, so, sponsor comments. First of all, on behalf of Simon Fraser University, I'd like to introduce Ryan, Ryan Watmo. Uh, Ryan is the Director of Community Economic Development Certificate Programme, and he's going to say a few words of welcome for today's event on behalf of SFU. Ryan? Thanks very much, Paul. Uh, yes. Good afternoon. My name is Ryan Wadmo. I'm the Director of the Community Economic Development Certificate Programme, and it's my pleasure to join you today as I look at the beautiful quadrangle it actually no, it's my pleasure to, to join you from my home in Invermere, BC, a nine hour drive away on a shared unceded home of the Sequetmic, the Tanaha, and the chosen homeland of the Columbia Valley Metis. I'm a product turned enabler of digital transformation. 2020 was the first September in over 100 years that Canadian communities didn't send their best and brightest overseas to war or to cities for school. And at a time with so much uncertainty, we turned our analog, in person, in community delivery model to entirely virtual. This strategy allowed us to support our students and grow the CD movement to every home and village across Canada. But at this point, you're probably asking yourself, what is community economic development? CD for short is an inclusive and participatory process by which communities initiate and generate their own multiple bottom line solutions to economic problems. We work on the complex multi-sector issues that require an understanding of your entire community, its businesses, it's government, nonprofits, and residents. The five principles of CD are uh, livelihoods focused, diverse and inclusive, sustainable, place based, community controlled, and online through a mix of synchronous and asynchronous learning. Okay, I squeezed that sixth one in there. Together, it's the inclusive and sustainable kind of economic development that we need now more than ever. SFU has been running this non credit certificate program in CD for decades, but it's traditionally been taught in person. Like many of you here today, over these past few years, we adapted to suit the times. 
Our evolving 13 course program is now fully online, taught via video on the robust Canvas platform and live on Zoom through sessions with our subject matter expert instructors. I coach students on the phone or on Zoom or Teams or text, whatever works for them, when it works for them. Throughout the pandemic and ongoing climate change related emergencies, communities need to prioritize issues and collaborate online to evolve their economies. So we had to continue training the people who are ready to do just that. And I'm pleased to report it's a resounding success. Moving to digital delivery meant we were able to serve our student in Pond Inlet in Nunavut, just like we can support our students in Burnaby or Alberta and all parts in between. We have been able to increase the value of the course for our students while saving them so much time and money from travel. Time and money they can invest in developing their communities. I included, oh, I included both the program's URL and my email address in the chat. Thanks for your time and go build a sustainable future. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you very much for your support of the uh, the event today. We also have today uh, Lindsay Hazelton on behalf of the Faculty of Commerce and Business Administration at Douglas College. Lindsay. Thank you so much, Paul, and thank you all for coming today. Um, on behalf of D Douglas College, um, I'm actually working at home today, but I've got a virtual backdrop of our Anvil Office Tower in New Westminster, uh, one of the newer buildings um, at Douglas. And since the topic today is digital transformation, I just wanted to um, share some news about a new program that we've launched at Douglas in the past um, four months. And that's our post-baccalaureate diploma in digital marketing. So with this program, you, you can do courses in e-commerce, paid search advertising, uh, SEO, digital marketing analytics, and you would get through this program, the Google Analytics individual qualification and AdWords certification, as well as the opportunity to do an internship. Um, this program, it's mostly um, a mix of in-person in New West and online. Um, I think like a lot of us, we've been uh, you know, adapting to the, to the new educational environment with, with some online um, delivery. And um, this is a, a two-year program that you can do flexibly as well. So if, if you have any questions about it, um, I'm happy to share my contact information uh, through the chat. Um, the other thing I just wanted to, um, to let everyone know, since I know many of you are in the, in the business community, at Commerce and Business, we've actually been in the process of uh, trying to, to reinvigorate our alumni connections. And I'm not sure if any of you are Douglas alums, but um, if you are, uh, nice to meet you. And what I, I wanted to share with you is that we, we are going to be looking in the next six months or so for some new members on our program advisory committees. So those would be... Um, marketing, finance, accounting, uh, business law, um, as well as some uh, computer science programs. So um, if that's something you'd be interested in, what, what PAC members do is they um, attend a meeting, it's maybe only, only twice a year, and provide feedback to our faculty members on the actual courses within the program and what industry is looking for. Um, we, we've been running packs for years, but through COVID, they've become a little bit stale. So we're hoping to really uh, reinvigorate the membership and have a very um, active um, advisory um, membership. So again, um, I'll, I'll send out some info through um, through the Burn Burnaby Board of Trade. But if you're interested, I'm going to put my info in, in the chat and it would be great to get to know some of you. So uh, thank you so much and, and look forward to, to hopefully seeing some of you um, again soon. Thank you, Lindsay, and appreciate your support very much today as well. And uh, um, last but not least, on behalf of BCIT School of Business and Media, I'd like to introduce uh, Nellie Tink, and Nellie is the International Programs Advisor. Um, over to you. Thank you, Paul. Hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be here today because the topic is super interesting, digital transformation. Um, at BCIT, we want to empower everyone in BC to have those uh, digital skills that are required to work in this new world where, you know, things are changing and transforming. And today, I just very quickly want to highlight some programs that we have where um, people can learn in a very flexible way some of those new skills. So we have a micro-credential in digital transformation where you can take 
take some courses entirely online that focus on just one specific skill. Um, you can do it in a few hours, for example, how to set up an e-commerce website, how to present and analyze data in a digital world. Um, and then also for working professionals, we have some graduate certificates, programs that are nine months long. They're taught in the evening, easy to combine, um, a mix of in-person and online, and they also focus on those digital transformation skills. So we have one graduate certificate in business analytics, you know, uh, how to transform large and complex data sets and turn it into valuable information. We have one about global leadership, which is all about how do you actually lead virtual teams and lead remotely. And then finally, I'm also the program head of um, the Graduate Certificate in Business Administration, which sounds like it has nothing to do with digital transformation, but in all of the courses, we look at how new technologies are embedded into business, into marketing, into operations, management, accounting even. So if you want to acquire new skills, then one of those programs might be of interest to you. It's super flexible, very easy to combine with daytime employment. And just like uh, the other people, I will put in the chat some extra information in my contact details. So feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you, Nelly. And again, we appreciate your support. Um, so let's get on with the um, the session today. Um, I think it's fair to say that the lessons from the pandemic were, were clear for all of us, that, that businesses really need the ability to operate anytime, anywhere. Actually, Chad and I were chatting um, before, before we started today just about some of the programming that we helped to bring in with our post-secondary partners in the early days of COVID to really help businesses who, who hadn't really had a chance to start their digital transformation um, to, to, to begin that journey. And, and it's something that we'll be looking at very much going forward as well. Um, so business owners, we know, recognize this need. And sometimes it's, 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 it's really just the challenge of understanding how to make some of those earlier steps and really understanding what opportunities are out there. And so we're looking forward to the presentation today um, to, to, to get a bit of uh, background information on that. So we're going to hear today from Chad Chang, CPA CMA, and Matthew Wong, CPA CGA, who are the co-founders and advisors of Purpose CPA. Uh, Purpose provides accounting and tax, advisory, bookkeeping, and technology services to small and medium businesses that are interested in more than just the bottom line. Purpose CPA is a proud member of the Birmingham Board of Trade and is a certified living wage employer. So I'm gonna hand it over to, to Chad and Matthew. If you have any questions uh, uh, that, that arise uh, during the course of the presentations, please pop them in the chat or the Q&A area and we'll try to get to them at the end. So Chad, Matthew, um, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Paul. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, we'll start the presentation right now where Matt will lead us through the introduction. Awesome, thank you for that, Paul. Um, so if we, so quick, uh, just a quick review of our agenda today. So we're going to talk about three topics. Uh, we're just going to give you a quick overview of some of the digital trends and some of the pandemic data that you guys are probably feeling, but uh, we'll bring up some data points just to validate uh, some of those items. Uh, and then we'll go into uh, the, the pro tips area. So we'll show you uh, a demo of QuickBooks Online, uh, Dext and, and WagePoint itself. And hopefully uh, if you guys are already considering moving to the cloud, that will kind of help uh, validate and so aspire you to move to the cloud, or it'll give you some more tips in order in to just get more use out of it. And finally, we'll talk about the new uh, Canada Digital Adoption Program. So the federal government recognizes that need for businesses to transform themselves digitally. Uh, they are also providing uh, grant funding and uh, loan uh, interest-free loans for businesses to do that. So thank you, Paul, for the uh, for the introduction earlier uh, about uh, about me and Chad and the firm ourselves. We can jump through a couple of those slides here, right? Uh, so we just go to the next slide. Yeah, about ourselves, uh, we're senior finance leaders, both Chad and myself. Uh, we are we have thirty years combined experience. Uh, we like to describe ourselves as operators, technologists, and relationship builders. Uh, we've been in businesses for a very long time, so we are passionate about talking to our clients about their businesses uh, and we're passionate about understanding their daily challenges and just using as much technology as possible to uh, simplify their lives. As part of our, our couple of our different service lines um, for bookkeeping, advisory, and for tax services, we employ a team of cloud bookkeepers, accountants, and tax accountants to do that sort of work. So on the left-hand side, we have our core sort of 
public practice areas, bookkeeping, compilation, tax returns, right? And then on the on the middle and on the right is kind of where me and Chad, uh, that's where kind of our strengths are in our, our business, where we provide that sort of part-time controllership for your full-time business, right? And finally, uh, just on the technology side, uh, we're doing a, a lot of uh, technology consultations and delivery um, uh, for businesses to transform themselves. Okay, thanks so much for that, Matt. Um, yeah, I'm just going to jump right into our next section, uh, which is about digital trends and pandemic data. Um, I'm a big um, a guy in terms of macro events, and I like to see where um, trends are uh, through uh, many data points. Um, so before the pandemic, uh, this was research that was done by uh, the Business Development Bank of Canada or BDC. Um, there were four out of 10 Canadian SMEs that had an online presence, about 40%. And of those, uh, they were mid-sized uh, businesses. Uh, so um, uh, from uh, over 100 employees up to 499 employees had reported conducting online sales. And smaller size businesses, uh, businesses that had one to 99 employees uh, said that they've only 23% conducted sales. And this survey was based on uh, 1485, just about 1,500 Canadian businesses uh, that did the survey. So yeah, close to uh, half of all Canadian SMEs didn't have a website in 2017, uh, according to Statistics Canada. Uh, a very small percentage just had an online presence. Uh, only 15% of respondents identified the cost of setting up uh, an online store as a top challenge. Uh, businesses generally spent on average uh, $37,000 on their website and about $29,000 on their marketing uh, in the last three years. So larger businesses tend to spend uh, more, uh, roughly seven times more than smaller businesses to optimize their, their online presence. So smaller businesses, it's tough to invest that um, as there are demands, other cash flow demands um, uh, before the pandemic and even during the pandemic. In 2019, most uh, small businesses invested mostly in, in a company website and social media. So just having an online presence. Of those that had an online presence, four out of five of them had a website. But their website was basically just their presence. Um, didn't have much more aside from that. Uh, sadly, roughly uh, one in five of these businesses had a platform that allowed for transactions. So during pre-pandemic, you can tell small businesses, um, yeah, a, a small fraction of them just had an online presence, just presence in social media, whether that is just social media or a website. During the pandemic, um, uh, the large consulting firm McKinsey had found that uh, in the first three months of 2020, there was the same amount of online e-commerce uh, penetration as there was in the previous 10 years. Um, so, I mean, who remembers the start of the pandemic? Everybody, everybody was affected. Uh, it was not something that we'd like to remember, but I think a lot of you would have recalled that uh, there was a lot more online spending uh, to be able to buy supplies or um, get access to things you would had to get online. So having an online storefront and social media uh, would not be enough. And there's a strong case to start conducting transactions and fulfillment online. Um, so we found that not only was it um, that it was the younger generation uh, of Gen Zs and millennials driving this trends, but we also found that older shoppers have also moved online due to the pandemic. So a local business example that I can bring up is during the pandemic, um, I had connected with a local, biz, um, a local food chain. 
Um, and they had applied for the small business recovery grant as well as the launch online grant. But we helped them out with the small business recovery grant. This was the the, the BC funded program that um, allocated, I, th- I think it was upwards to $300 million for small businesses. Um, it was pushing them towards online and they had to, in order to be able to sell, um, they had to create a portal to allow customers to order uh, online. They had to connect with uh, food delivery apps like the uh, DoorDash and Skip My Dishes. Um, but they also needed the funding to help um, renovate their, uh, their, um, their location to be able to allow people to come in to pick up orders uh, safely and to do so where their staff felt it was safe too. There was difficulty in hiring at that time. So they had to balance out their business, which was primarily um, a brick and mortar and still is a brick and mortar uh, business where people come in to order. But uh, restaurants, like uh, you all know, they, they were shut down um, by, by provincial orders, but they had to quickly change and digital allowed them to quickly change. The international organization, the OECD, um, has found that during the, uh, during the pandemic uh, globally, um, up to 70% of SMEs are making more use of digital technologies. Um, they have found that uh, they have found that uh, as part of that study, the PayPal uh, uh, did a study in Canada um, by the fall of 2020. Um, SMEs in Canada, 67% were accepting online payments. The pandemic has really accelerated digital commerce. And 47% of them started doing so since the start of the the pandemic. The majority of online small businesses um, believe that e-commerce is now necessary to to conduct business, to to have a successful business. In fact, 69% of online small business owners said that selling online has made them more successful. And without that possibility, 58% of small business owners said that their business would not survive COVID-19. However, um, a large part of this respondents also did say that um, investment and also understanding how to do that is a big challenge for them. So I want to further highlight the, the point that since the pandemic, more Canadians are adapting to technology. Um, and at all levels of proficiency. Um, According to a multi-year study done by Statistics Canada uh, released in April of this year, um, you can see that from 2018 to 2020, the share of Canadians identified as non-users or basic users of internet and digital technologies um, had uh, risen from uh, 23%. So this represented uh, from uh, from sorry from about eighteen percent up to about twenty three percent for for uh, basic users. So this represented a shift of almost one point four millions from the have not to the have side. The people who were not uh, in tune with technology, you could say, or have not uh, made that shift towards digitals. Um, a large number of them, um, over a million of the Canadians, have transitioned uh, to the have side, uh, moving more in tune or using digital technologies. Uh, overall, as a group, all levels of internet proficiencies increased, uh, and that meant online purchases have also increased. I want to also share a situation uh, of businesses that are seeing uh, more increased activities. Uh, I've been in contact with the local businesses, which is a um, uh, a restaurant business, uh, sole uh, company. They're not franchised. Uh, They are already on social media and uh, Facebook, um, Instagram, and have connected with uh, like the Uber Eats as well as DoorDash. Um, But uh, the predominant amount of business that she feels and still sees right now is through social media. Uh, she still wants to invest in more social media 
to drive more imprints and uh, traffic. Uh, and that's also further highlighted too um, by Shopify. Some of you might heard of a large Canadian uh, technology company uh, that is facilitating a lot of the business, e-commerce business right now throughout the country as well as globally. Um, they have highlighted in their annual um, future report uh, the importance of uh, your brand, building your brand, having a connection with your customer Small businesses are definitely picking up on that, uh, trying to find ways to um, enhance their brand, continue to have new messages and establish relationships with the customers through the use of like social media. I'll pass it on over to pro tips for cloud apps for, for Matt. Thanks for that, Chad. So, you know, earlier we talked a lot about uh, just the digital trends and kind of the, the, the transformation that's happening both in the consumer uh, and also probably in the employees where a lot of them are moving online and have the expectation to work online. So, you know, if you're, uh, we're going to go through a couple of pro tips on the back end uh, side of things in the applications. Um, so there's a couple areas uh, we'll focus on. We'll focus on QuickBooks Online, we'll focus on Dext, and we'll focus on WagePoint. Uh, you, the core accounting product that surrounds a business is probably your accounting. Uh, it's probably, you're probably using some sort of similar product, but the functionality is very much the same and the sort of maximizing the use is very much the same. So we're going to show you how to, um, uh, we're going to show you and demo to you the uh, whole notion of connecting or uploading bank transactions in QuickBooks itself. Uh, we're going to show you some pro tips in terms of using bank rules, which will allow you to automate some of the uh, EP and the data entry piece of it. Uh, we'll also show you how to uh, create a digital filing cabinet. So all those receipts and invoices that you have in your business, rather than filing it away into a folder and shoving it into a drawer somewhere, uh, we're able to use a, a feature in uh, QBO or another application called Dext. Uh, to help you uh, uh, record and save all those uh, all those receipts somewhere, uh, and then we'll also um, now that you've now that you digitize all those receipts, right? What happens then? We'll we'll show you the whole uh, concept of organizing AP, right, and using the sort of application itself to really power the sort of data entry piece of it, uh, and then the whole concept of publishing it and matching those transactions into the bank feed in QuickBooks Online. Uh, finally, we'll spend a little bit of time uh, in terms of uh, the opportunity to look at your payroll and how you can digitize your payroll using QuickBooks Online. There's a couple of neat features in there uh, that uh, will certainly, if you are quite uh, paper-based, uh, if you're still doing a lot of paper-based payroll, you're probably able to use Quick QuickBooks Payroll to help uh, uh, improve that process. And then if you're already on some sort of online uh, payroll provider, we'll, uh, I'll show you a bit of wage point. Uh, and kind of the additional features that you can use in another product called WagePoint to automate your payroll further. So we've uh, we've used that for a lot of our clients to uh, to really just drive down the sort of uh, the amount of processing time for uh, for payroll. Awesome. So uh, I'm excited. I'm going to pull up. Uh, I'm going to share a screen here and just pull up our our demo system here. So here is our hypothetical Metro Vancouver based business called Digitally Transformed Incorporated. Uh, it's owned by a person named, aptly named Terrence Tech, right? And they've, they provide services, professional services to, uh, to local businesses here. So the core of doing the bookkeeping is really around the banking feature and the bank feed feature in, in QuickBooks Online. Traditionally, what you would have done before is you probably would have gathered all your receipts, put it into an envelope, right? And then your, your bookkeeper or your external accountant will ask for your a printout or your monthly bank statements from CIBC and whatnot. From there, they would do their magic, typically in Excel, and record all the transactions in Excel figure out the GL category and then force all the taxes and uh, check the receipts against it. And then they would manually enter that into their accounting system. What's changed here is just the notion of connecting your bank feed. So now what QuickBooks recommends you do is 
you're able to actually connect through your online banking. And when you connect through your online banking here, so you can see, for example, this RBC Visa account is actually a connection here. So it's actually connected to, for the purposes of this demo system, we connected it to one of our RBC accounts, uh, Visa accounts here. It has a, a sync and it is actually pulling transactions from, uh, from the bank. So our latest spends, so uh, I was, uh, you know, Terrence Tech was at WeWork last week and booked a day pass. These are the transactions are, they're not being entered manually by the bookkeeper or by the owner. This is pulling directly from the bank feed itself, right? So that's one way. It's, uh, it's super important to do that. Um, you know, I, I must say there's a bit of a caveat because of the new um, uh, cybersecurity uh, improvements are taking place in the banking industry. They've turned on a lot of two-factor authentication. So uh, even though you can connect the bank feed, it will require you to authenticate, right? So different banks have different ways of authenticating, right? But it is a it is it is an additional hassle, but we firmly believe it's the right direction to go just to secure your information. Right? Another way you can do if if you choose not to connect that bank feed or you find a two-factor authentication is too much of a hassle, you can actually log into your online banking and you can download bank transactions into a CSV uh, file or a .qbo file, right? So you can do it once a week, every day, every month, if you want, right? But in this case here for CIBC checking, this was performed through a upload. This is not connected. You can see here, there's no connection here. Uh, it is a peer upload of that CSV file and just getting all those transactions without entering them one by one in detail into the, uh, into the accounting system. So let's, let's see how that works here. So uh, in the case of our TD MasterCard, right, we have no transactions, but we know there's a bunch of, uh, of expenses that we want to record, right? So let's do that. So how do we do that? So we go here to link account and we go upload from the file. Uh, you can drag and drop, right? So in here we go drag and drop and we're gonna choose the file. So this file I already downloaded from our, from our banking, right? And it's in the original format. We didn't change it or anything, but we, you know, I opened it up, take a look, looked at it. And so we're gonna select that file and then we're gonna go continue. And we're going to select the account that we want to upload the uh, the transactions to. We're going to select the TD Mastercard. So in here, I remember the the format itself. So it should be date, month, year here, right? But you can see it already has a header. It already has the columns, and it just suggests asking for the date. The reason why it's already uh, pre-filled it is because we're downloading it directly from the bank in that .csv file. Or if you're doing in that .qbo file, it'll be even faster. So we just go continue. And then from here, we know there's, uh, I think, 17 transactions in here, right? Uh, from the credit card, I'm just going to select all. And we'll continue. And we're going to import these transactions into the bank feed. And that's done. So now we have imported those transactions into the bank feed. So that's, you know, that's the first core element of, of really getting the most of the QuickBooks on is connecting the bank feed itself, right? Or uploading the transactions that will reduce your data entry by a lot. Now, keep in mind, while it is in the bank feed, these transactions are in the bank feed, they are not in your accounting records yet. They need to be, uh, they need to be posted or in, you know, in the words of, um, QuickBooks, they need to be categorized into the, into the, into the general ledger. So all these transactions, someone, all these transactions, someone needs to go and, and review them. And you could one by one manually add them and categorize them, right? Break out the taxes, choose the category and then add. And then only in doing so is where you're recording it into your accounting system. But so how do we, how do we make that a bit faster when, you're not talking about 17 credit card transactions, you're talking about 170 transactions for the month. Well, the first thing you can do is you can actually create, uh, you can actually use bank rules, 
uh, to help speed up the process. So bank rules is a way for, um, it's a way just to quickly categorize common transactions, right? And it's a way, it's really useful for uh, small amounts, right? Or recurring transactions where you know it's always the same $20 uh, Google domain that you need to pay for every month, for example. So let's take a look at that. So I already created some of them, right? So in the case of Terrence Tech, he needs to travel to his clients. He doesn't have his own car. So he likes to use Evo and car to go a lot. And he also uh, sometimes has to pay for parking when he travels into downtown Vancouver. So in here, we already created a rule, right? Because these are common expenses that are quite minor, right? And are quite small. And we may not want to, uh, we have the receipt somewhere, but we may not want to track everything, right? So in this rule is so in this rule itself, let's take a look at the rule. So this is called a trap. We created a travel rule. It says anytime you have money that comes out of this TD MasterCard bank account and, and the bank description contains any of these descriptions, car to go, Evo, pay by phone. What it'll do is it will automatically categorize it. You can select the category to travel, and you can also break out the taxes in here. And when you save this rule, what the bank feed does now and QBO does is it will look at a series of those rules and it will suggest to you to say, okay, anytime I see the description for Evo and it came out of the TD MasterCard account, I'm going to suggest to you to post it to TD uh, to travel and here's taxes and then you can manually go in and and you can manually go and add them one by one right so you can kind of skip the process of categorization and choosing the taxes where it becomes even more powerful is just the concept of auto adding right so say uh we don't even want to manually add them one by one we just want the system to take care of it for us what we can do is when we go into that rule we could turn on something called auto add. So we go travel and we scroll down to the very bottom. There's something called auto add. We go save. So you can see all those Evo, car to go, pay by phone transactions. They're no longer in this bank feed. The bank feed is already been categorized. And now those transactions are now posted into your, um, into your uh, general ledger. So that's the that's one pro tip to use uh, the rules, right? You could create as many rules as you want. You could create rules one by one, right? You can create auto add, right? Um, and it just helps you to quickly categorize expenses. So what happens if you um, if you have a lot of receipts and you want to start digitizing some of them? Right. Or what happens if you have a lot of receipts and just the sort of amount of uh, data processing time takes too long? Well, you can go into QuickBooks Online and explore the receipt feature in here. So the receipt feature is, a, is part of the QuickBooks Online subscription. And the receipt feature allows you to upload uh, the receipts into QuickBooks. And it will use a combination of optical character recognition uh, machine learning and AI to help um, read that read that uh, image and you know parse out all the information the vendor the uh, invoice date the amount the sales tax right and it will also scan all the data that it has in its own um, in its own database uh, to say okay well in general for example um, uh, Starbucks from all our other businesses is always coded to meals and entertainment. It will smartly suggest to you to code to meals and entertainment. So how do we, uh, how do we get a receipt into QuickBooks Online? So there's a couple of different places you can do it. Uh, you can do it via the mobile app. So if, you already have your, if you're already on QuickBooks Online, you just download the mobile app and you can take a picture of it and upload right in. Another way you can do it is to, uh, to forward the email. So in here, you can see in this receipt uh, area, this email is a custom email. Anytime you send a, uh, you send a file uh, over, it will, it, will off, it will upload it into the system. Or you can finally drag and drop uh, a file. 
So let, let's let's see that in uh, let's see that uh, in action. So if we upload the file here, all right, it's so already created one, and I'm going to upload that WeWork invoice that we saw earlier on the uh, RBC visa. Okay. So you can see here now it's being processed. So the reason why it's it's processing it's because the technology is employing that combination of OCR machine learning to read all that information, right? So that time where, you know, normally you would be doing it yourself or your bookkeeper would be sitting there looking at a physical receipt, creating a, uh, creating a transaction, entering in WeWork July 7th, $35 subtotal, $1.75 GST. The system is doing that for you. Right, so it takes a little bit of time because you can imagine the amount of transactions that are going through the system, right? And it's it's just uh, it takes a little bit of time to process that. But you can see here, it's uh, it's it is working, and you can you can upload multiple multiple receipts and just let the system do its work. So you can see here, um, I already did an example of that here. This one's already completed. It's already saved a copy of it. It's put in the payment date, the amount, right? Uh, and it's already suggested the, the a category, right? I believe I had to create the PE here and I put in the sales tax and it'll remember that for the next time. So that's partly done uh, both by the system and both partly done by application and partly uh, manually completed by myself here, right? So what I do here is you can see that's done here. And go save and next, right? And we're going to just select the account here. It's paid out of the. Um, and then we're just going to create the expense. Now, when you go back to the banking feature and you go to RBC Visa, you can see now in here, now that we enter that transaction. That expense has been created in general ledger and it's already uh, in the bank feed. It's just merely matching that transaction. All we have to do here is click match and then you're done. Right. And the beauty of it is all your receipts are now saved in here. Right. So you have, you don't have to maintain a copy of it anymore. Right. Uh, if you looked up uh, WeWork and you pulled up the expense, We have a copy of that invoice that's saved into the expense. So you have clear audit trail. So if you ever get audited, right? Or if you ever want to just um, maybe perhaps look back at an old invoice and see how come the last invoice was 50% less, right? You can go in there and you have clear audit trail, right? So you can, essentially it's your digital filing cabinet for your business. So, we, we use another application called DEX, which carries out similar functionality to this receipt feature. It is a separate application. Uh, it does cost uh, a little bit more to, to do it because you need to get a separate subscription for this. Uh, typically, this is more useful for, uh, this is more useful for higher volume uh, businesses where you have more, uh, more transactions. And if you start to require multiple users, so the functionality is very similar. You can add documents here. So you can do it the same way. You can either upload it via the mobile app, you can forward it, right? Or you can drag and drop. So you can see here, you can see a couple of files in here, right? Uh, that are being processed, right? So let's try to drag and drop a couple of files in here. So we have two invoices that we need to process. All right, we're going to put this in. So digitally transform engages purpose CPA for its monthly bookkeeping services. So they have an invoice and they also have a, a local marketing agency that helps them uh, do digital marketing. So we're just going to upload these, uh, these invoices. So we're going to upload one. Okay, so you can see here, oh, logged out. 
Another difference between uh, QuickBooks Online receipts and Dext um, is that QuickBooks Online is only uh, one email specific. So it will only accept receipts from one email. Dext has a public facing email. So if you have any vendors that are sending you receipts, you can give them that email. And every, every time they send you receipts, it'll go right into Dext. They don't have to send you the invoice and then you forward it into QuickBooks. So that's one of the, the major limitations between the two. Yeah, that's a good point, Chad. And I think the, also the, uh, the having multiple emails, multiple users uh, is important um, because just the, um, that the, uh, the multiple feature, the multiple users are important just because uh, if you are a larger business and you want some clear audit trail, you probably want to know who's sending in receipts, right? Uh, which one of your staff is sending that in, right? If you ever need to ask questions or you need to trace a transaction, uh, uh, Dex allows you to have multiple users with access, right? So you can see earlier, um, we had just uploaded a couple of transactions, right, via upload. So we process the, um, we upload this uh, hashtag marketing invoice. So you can see it's it's working in the backgrounds. The, the system itself quickly recognized the invoice, the supplier name, right? But it's still trying to figure out the date and invoice number. So we'll let it kind of uh, do its magic and work in the background. You can see here, while we upload the purpose CPA invoice uh, at the same time, it processed it rather quickly. And why did it do that? It's because it's relying on machine learning. You know, QuickBooks uh, invoices, if you look at this, is a standard format provided by QuickBooks. We ourselves have sent, you know, this invoice to our own clients. The machine learning has quickly recognized that. It's quickly learned from that. So it's able to process that quite quickly. And you can see here, uh, it's, and it's done all its magic. It's pulled the supplier, the invoice date, the due date, it suggested a category, it put in the amount, and it forced out the taxes. And, you know, we don't have anyone doing that sort of data entry for this transaction. So it's really useful. Um, and then finally, so now that, all these receipts are in, right, is the whole concept of publishing and matching. So I already showed you how to match uh, in, in, in QuickBooks, right, and publish in QuickBooks. We're just going to quickly show you index itself, right? So this index is actually integrated with QuickBooks. So through that integration, we're able to push that transaction into, uh, into QuickBooks. So you can see we're going to create a bill. Uh, we're going to publish this. Okay. And that's done should be uh, already in the system. Okay, so that's no longer there, so it's done. So we go back into QuickBooks, into the banking module. And you can see here immediately, this transaction, we sent an e-transfer to pay for purpose CPA on June 30th for 525. Uh, the bank information says purpose CPA, it right away recognizes that bill and it suggests QuickBooks Online will suggest that you match that and then you're done. That payable is, that bill was paid and that invoice is uh, off, off, the, off the AP. So I'm gonna do a quick, uh, quick overview just of the, um, the payroll function and just show you kind of the functionality that's, uh, that's in payroll. So yeah, if you're looking, if you're if you're still doing a lot of manual payroll, uh, now's the time to move to to digital payroll. Uh, there's lots of providers. You know, QuickBooks is just one of them. It's just built in. It's functional. I wouldn't say it's it's all the bells and whistles, but it certainly moves yourself forward. Um, but there's a couple of neat features I'd like to demonstrate that are uh, that's available in QuickBooks and probably available in a lot of other vendors as well. So firstly, the ability just to do digital onboarding for a new employee, all that information, all that information is shared and you can create, you can put in your first name, you can put in your email uh, for a new employee and you can also ask them to enter in their own personal information so they can fill in that information. Typically when you're hiring them, you don't have their, you may not have their address you know, may not have their uh, their preferences or how to get paid, nor their TD1 forms. So they could fill that in. And that's literally 
Uh, I would say that literally that button is a brand new button because when I was preparing for this feature and preparing for this presentation, this button was not available as of two days ago. Okay, and then finally you can do all the setup uh, and just record everything. So just for record keeping, vacation policy, their direct deposit, uh, their TD1 forms for, uh, for withholdings, uh, you can do everything online now. Second thing you can do is you can create a self-serve ter terminal for people to get their own, uh, their own pay stubs and their T4s as well. So in here, when a new employee is created, um, you can enter in their personal email and they'll send them an invitation. So when they log into, uh, they get that invitation, they can log into the workforce terminal. They can get their own pay stubs and get their own T4. So no more scrambling around to stuff the print pay stubs, stuff them in an envelope along with a check, right? Or, you know, if they ask for their T4 because they, they forgot about it and left it, they can get it themselves. And also and not, it gives them a chance to enter their hours. If they are out in the field and you need them to enter their hours to, when they have to punch in for work and punch out for work, it also allows for them to do that. Great point. Thirdly, uh, just the uh, just core feature around running payroll. So QuickBooks will update to the latest payroll tables. Clearly, uh, the taxes will change every year. CPPEI changes every year, right? So um, the ability for you not to have to manually calculate payroll, right, or go to the payroll calculator on the, CR, uh, on the CRA website, you can enter in, for example, Terrence Tech, his number of hours, and it'll tell you how much their net pay is, whether you're paying by check or direct deposit, or you, uh, and then the sort of uh, payroll taxes that are required to be remitted to the, uh, to the CRA. So you can run your auto payroll here. All right, you can also, and you can also print, uh, if you're using check stock, you can also format the check stock and then uh, format the printer. So if you're running multiple checks, right, rather than direct deposit for, uh, for employees, uh, you can run it uh, through a system and it'll just print off the, the, uh, the payee and the amount as well. And then finally, uh, just a neat uh, basic functionality is just the ability to, um, the ability to tell, to, to inform you how much, payroll taxes you owe when, right? And then when you need to pay it, you need to record that in the accounting system, right? Because more often than not, uh, people will forget, right? And then it doesn't match up against the amount that actually needs to be paid, right? So uh, in, in QuickBooks, uh, you have to do that manually, right? Uh, it's, uh, that's the one feature that's just uh, not available. Okay, so I'm going to quickly just uh, show you a couple of the, the last thing. Um, just on a wage point, uh, so the value add for wage point, unfortunately, wage point, uh, we don't have a demo ecosystem set up to show you, uh, but a couple, uh, a couple of things that, uh, that may be worth your while for wage point. So QuickBooks payroll, you can see, it just allows you to digitize some things. You don't have to do as much paper-based sort of work to do payroll. Wage point, you can further automate. Because beyond doing all those things in QuickBooks, you can also automatically remit your payroll taxes. WagePoint will take care of that for you. At year end, uh, your T4 summary that you would normally send to CRA, WagePoint will automatically submit that for you. Uh, when employees are terminated and require uh, a record of employment, you no longer need to fill in a manual form or go into web ROE. You can actually submit it and prepare the record of employment through WagePoint. And finally, wage point, uh, you can also put in your work safe premiums and remit your premiums along with your payroll. So it's just one less thing to do. So we really use wage point a lot for our clients where it just, it, it just truly automates a lot of the functionality uh, where you don't have to do uh, some of that work. So that's it, that's for the demo. Uh, I'm just gonna hand it back to Chad to uh, do a quick briefing on the uh, digital uh, adoption program. All right, great, thanks, Matt. Um, get you to stop share. Great, thanks, Matt. Okay, um, I'll quickly run through the uh, Canada Digital Adoption Plan. 
Um, we are approved digital advisors for this federal program. Uh, the federal level has committed $4 billion uh, to assist uh, small, medium-sized businesses to adopt new, tech, uh, new technologies. You'll remember that this is a string of uh, initiatives by multiple levels of the government, uh, really encouraging businesses to adopt technology to be more resilient, just in case we have another pandemic or we, or we don't. I, I think it uh, creates a lot of efficiencies. Um, so basically to uh, qualify your uh, Canadian business, uh, privately owned, uh, you have at least one full-time employee in 2021. Uh, grant funding, there's two streams for it, uh, depending on the size of their business. Uh, stream two for businesses that are larger, uh, that have at least half a million dollars of revenue, up to $100 million of revenue. And in at least one of the past year, you're able to qualify for up to $15,000 uh, to be able to do a digital plan. You have to do a plan to be able to assess the type of technology that are out there. Some companies have done this, some companies have not. And you'll be able to further access $100,000 in interest-free loan from the BD see after the digital plan is approved to implement. Uh, businesses that are that size can also apply for Stream 1, which is $2,400 of micro grants. Uh, but uh, businesses that are not that size, you, you can definitely access Stream Number 1 for that $2,400 of micro grant towards implementation towards uh, e-commerce. Uh, these are the parameters around that. Um, and not all businesses that are, um, uh, if you're a charity or if you're a public organization or if you're owned by a multinational or if you have shares that trade on publicly traded companies are, are not eligible for it. Um, I just want to highlight that. And some of the costs related to it for Stream One, you're developing that e-commerce. You're really trying to get online, doing back commerce, uh, uh, back office solution for e-commerce, SEO, social media marketing. Um, for Stream Two, it is to cover the fees to um, have a digital advisor such as yourself to develop this adoption plan, uh, in order for you to select the right type of system for your business. Uh, how do you apply? There is a online application. I'll have a link up in the next slide. Uh, they want to create a profile, uh, put in your information for the business, which is your business number, uh, your perhaps your tax forms. That's where you submit documents. You'll meet with a CDAP uh, liaison who will assess it with you and then tell you about the next steps uh, to go to. And this is general application process for both streams one and two. So how we can help um, at Purpose CPA, we're generally uh, about the technology in the background, the accounting systems, the flow of the transactions all the way to your financial systems. And that may also involve the uh, connection with CRMs, ERP, uh, and uh, HRS type of systems. We typically find that a lot of customers are asking about the digital marketing because I think they, they think that this program is just about digital marketing SEO. Um, uh, so we kind of differentiate. We have a partner organization called Big Cedar Agency. They take care of the more the front end about the website or the e-commerce setup, the integrations with it. We work with them because the flow of the information from the front end where customers uh, transact and put in their credit card information all the way to the back end where you have to reconcile all those transactions for income and uh, to your credit card uh, statements. Uh, that's how we, we, we work with other organizations. A little bit of a resource here. Um, uh, I let was kind enough that we can pass on our slide deck to participants uh, so they can get a copy of this. Uh, I know I'm going through really quickly about this, but you'll be able to get a copy of the slide deck. So you'll be able to have the resources uh, and links here. And thank you so much um, for attending here. Um, I'll open it up for questions and return it back to uh, Paul. Thank you, Chad, and, and thank you, Matt. Thanks very much for those uh, for, for the presentation there. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time today. Mm -hmm.